you track women through their uh, ovulation cycle and you show them a picture of a man, the same man, and you do nothing but vary his jaw width, when they're ovulating, the guy with the wider jaw is more attractive, and when they're not ovulating, the farthest away from that, the guy with the thinner jaw is more attractive, and that's associated with testosterone levels. And so women who are fertile like more masculine men, and basically, if you're on the pill, then you're never in that ovulation phase. And so one thing that may have happened, and I don't know this for sure, but it's, it's interesting to consider, is that since women have been taking the birth control pill, their preference for less masculine men has become more pronounced. And that could easily be one of the things that's fueling at least some of the tension that's existed and exists now politically between men and women. But the point is, is that you just cannot ignore the massive consequences of a biological revolution like that and to make any other factor causal when you're trying to understand the political movement, movements, especially in the last, say, 40 years, it's, you're putting the cart before the horse. Now, it's reasonable to point out that the pill wouldn't have been accepted as a technology if certain political changes with regards to the emancipation of women had, hadn't already been in place, right? No one would have even been allowed to do something like investigate contraception. So you can't separate the biological from the political entirely, but it's still... It's still very useful to organize your, organizing your thinking to realize just how profound a, 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 a revolution that was. But now back in the Victorian times, see, there's another thing about sexuality. Modern people like to think that there's nothing dangerous about sex, and that is like the stupidest thing you could possibly ever hypothesize, because everything about it is dangerous. It's dangerous emotionally, it's dangerous socially, it's dangerous because of the possibility of unwanted pregnancy, and it's dangerous because of the possibility of sickness, and that's a major one. I mean, so when AIDS emerged in the 1980s, that could have easily killed all of us. Now, the fact that it didn't was wonderful, but it did kill hundreds of millions of people. So it was no joke, it was a big deal, and AIDS mutated to take advantage of promiscuity, and so, the relationship between sexual behavior and the transmission of disease is actually mediated at the biological level. But anyways, back in the 1890s, they had the same problem, right? They had the problem with syphilis. And syphilis is one nasty disease. It's, it can mimic almost any other disease, and it's devastating to your nervous system, and you can pass it on to your children. And so, part of the reason that sexuality was heavily repressed in the Victorian period was not only because of the possibility of unwanted pregnancy, the relative poverty of people. You know, back in 1895 in, in Europe, the average person lived on less than a dollar a day in, in modern terms. You know, it's almost impossible to understand how poor people were. And so sex in a poverty stricken place is also a lot more dangerous than it is in a rich place because especially if you were, if, you know, it, given the lack of employment opportunities for women back in the Victorian period, if you happened to get pregnant out of wedlock, you were, in, you were in serious trouble. And so the fact that sexuality was repressed is hardly, is hardly a surprise because it was so difficult to integrate into the full-fledged personality, you know, and it, as, it, as it still is.